vision If you would have asked me then if I think there is really a planet X, I would have said no. But if you ask me now, my answer will be yes. I believe there is a Nibiru in our solar system. Let me show you why. Originally, I didn't see how a huge planet, four times the size of Jupiter, can exist in our solar system without us knowing. But that is before I learned about TNO. Before I did extensive research on ancient prophecies, which, believe it or not, collaborated somehow. Let me put it this way. You may not recognize Nibiru when it comes, and the visit may be different from what you expected, but believe me, there is a Nibiru out there in our solar system. For people who are new to this Planet X Nibiru theory, let me give you a quick tour. According to the ancient Sumerians, the 10th planet Nibiru is on a highly elliptic 3600 year orbit. It is called the destroyer planet, as when it comes, it will bring destruction and possibly the doomsday. Wait! If doomsday comes every 3600 years, how come we're still here? Think about it this way. Many comets pass by our sun regularly. How many of them hit planets? The last and only one I remember was the Shoemaker Levy 9 hitting Jupiter in July 1994. So maybe Nibiru's last flyby was harmless last time. But we may not be likely so lucky next time. Before jumping to any conclusions we cannot sustain, let me bring you another popular Nibiru theory. The planet Nibiru of Nemesis. Nemesis is supposedly our sun's brown dwarf twin. The theory was first introduced in 1984, largely based on the Earth's mass extension 26 million year cycle. An evil twin 1.5 light years away, hidden beyond the Oort cloud would be a perfect suspect. If Nibiru was a planet of Nemesis, it could explain how its occupants survived 3600 years without a sun. Nemesis is Nibiru's travel companion and its portable generator. When the theory was introduced in 1984, it made great sense, and at that time, scientists believed that most stars are binary. Obviously, our sun should not be an exception. However, scientists have determined that mass extinction happens more like every 50 million years, and two mass astronomical surveys, which ran from 1997 to 2001, failed to detect any brown dwarf in our solar system. While in 2011, NASA's David Morrison, who specializes in near-Earth objects, concluded that even with infrared telescopes able to detect brown dwarfs as far away as 10 light years, failed to find Nemesis. It is most likely that Nemesis does not exist. Of course, that is if you believe in what NASA tells you. However, not finding any proof of Nibiru nor Nemesis does not mean they do not exist. Plus, how do you know if you were told the truth? What do you think the government should do if they think the world will end tomorrow? Obviously, telling you will not be on the top of the list. They will build a bunker and plan shelters for people that may survive the doomsday Earth. And to avoid chaos, it is wise not to share the doomsday news with anyone. Plus, who can know for certain what will happen, right? If you think the government will always do the right thing, let me tell you what Nostradamus thought about that. will be struck from the sky. One who cannot proceed any further. The secret closed up with the revelation, such that they will march over and ahead. If you have any doubts about Nostradamus's prophecies, Check out some of my Nostradamus videos. When I compared his quatrains with historical events, I was shocked to find the unbelievable details revealed. Check out any of my videos and you will be surprised. This quatrain is grouped with 20 other Doomsday quatrains in the second part of the Book of Prophecy, which I call the Doomsday Century. 
This quatrain seems to indicate that our government would get warnings from the sky, which can be divine, or from aliens. The message warns us, do not proceed. It is a secret that will be kept from most of us. But the warnings were probably ignored as the last sentence stated, quote, such that they will march over and ahead. Whatever the secret may be, it will be ignored, and we, mankind, will eventually face the consequences. So, if Nemesis does not exist and Nibiru is only a theory, why should we waste any more time talking about it? Actually, I think Nibiru does exist. It may be different from the mythical planet where Anun Naki reside, but it is there. Let me show you the proof about Nibiru's existence. Consider this, if you think the theory about Nibiru's 3600 year orbit around the Sun is crazy, did you know Mars orbits the Sun every 687 days, but is already considered outside the Goldilocks zone that could harbor lives? What is the chance of life on Nibiru if Nibiru does exist? Plus, what is the chance of having a planet having a 3600 year orbit? The good old days when textbooks told you everything you needed to know is long gone. Now the more we know, the more we know we don't know. For example, when you search on the planet Eris, what you see is that it is called the most, means that we really don't know what we're talking about. Pluto and Eris both are known dwarf planets, and Tino, the so-called trans-Neptunian objects, those are minor planets with highly elliptical orbits. And if you search Wikipedia for trans-Neptunian object, a session called putative trans-Neptunian objects of planetary size will jump out at you. It states, the existence of trans-Neptunian rock ice bodies of planetary size ranging from less than Earth mass up to a brown dwarf has been often postulated for different theoretical reasons to explain several observed or speculated features of the Kuiper Belt or the Oort Cloud. It was recently proposed to use ranging data from the New Horizons spacecraft to constrain the position of such a hypothesized body. Putative means generally considered or reputed to be. Doesn't this sound like an endorsement from Wikipedia? I guess Nibiru is not all BS after all. Another reason I believe planet Nibiru is real is based on what scientists found in 2003. Sedna is a red dwarf planet 86 astronomical units away from the Sun, which is about three times as far as Neptune. Its discovery helped push poor Pluto off the planetary lineup. But what is important to know is its crazy orbit. Its aphelion, which is the closest distance from the Sun, is 76 AU. But its perihelion is 936 AU. And it takes 11,400 years to complete an orbit. During its 11,400 year journey around the Sun, we can only get a glance when it is near us. So, can you imagine how many more planets we have not seen? Can you imagine how big the others may be? Sedna's discovery proves Nibiru is not a myth. And then we found in 2014 FE72. It is another trans-Neptunian object, but this one has an orbit period of 90,000 years, with a perihelion of 36.3 AU and an aphelion of 4,000 AU. This really pushes our solar system. Is Why would life choose to grow on a planet so far away from the sun? Well, I guess we don't get to pick our birthplace, right? We have to adapt to our environment, correct? Plus, life may have started on a beautiful, friendly planet till the planet changed. For that, I will share with you another story we are all quite familiar with. The Shoemaker Levy 9. Did you know before Shoemaker Levy 9's impact with Jupiter, it was not orbiting the Sun? That is a fact few people know. 
The comet shoemaker Levy 9 was orbiting Jupiter before it got dangerously close and crashed. Two years before impact, shoemaker Levy 9 was orbiting the Sun. A wrong place at the wrong time changed the comet's path and destiny. So, an advanced civilization may have been flourishing on Nibiru before the planet changed its course. Or maybe Nibiru was pulled away by another star. Maybe it is our Sun's binary twin. Its advanced technology made it possible to cope with whatever harsh environment and its residents refused to leave home. Scientists feel the chance of our Sun having a twin star is slim. But what gravity forces keep these minor planets circling our Sun and something else on these elliptical orbits? There must be another massive body on the other end. Remember, we can only see them when they are close to us. Can you imagine how many more are out there that we have not seen? If the Earth has survived till today, why should we worry? Even if there are a million Nibirus out there, they probably won't come closer than Pluto, right? That may be right, but since we know so little, we have to rely on people who know more. And that is the problem. We have found so many new planets and new stars. Who will know what the next... The story exposes a secret society called the Illuminati. This shadowy group has a very real secret. It's a story of money, murder, and mystery right here in the valley. I have tried to pretend that everything is okay, but everything is not okay. We will make a lot of money. We are all living in the world that created who? Other organizations that shall remain nameless. How far are you willing to go to change the world? You must leave. If you do not disperse, you may be arrested and or subject to other police action. Most of the riot control agents and or less lethal munitions. If you would have asked me then if I think there is really a planet X, I would have said no. But if you ask me now, my answer will be yes. I believe there is a Nibiru in our solar system. Let me show you why. Originally, I didn't see how a huge planet, four times the size of Jupiter, can exist in our solar system without us knowing. But that is before I learned about TNO. Before I did extensive research on ancient prophecies, which, believe it or not, collaborated somehow. Let me put it this way. You may not recognize Nibiru when it comes, and the visit may be different from what you expected, but believe me, there is a Nibiru out there in our solar system. For people who are new to this Planet X Nibiru theory, let me give you a quick tour. According to the ancient Sumerians, the 10th planet Nibiru is on a highly elliptic 3600 year orbit. It is called the destroyer planet, as when it comes, it will bring destruction and possibly the doomsday. Wait! If doomsday comes every 3600 years, how come we're still here? Think about it this way. Many comets pass by our sun regularly. How many of them hit planets? The last and only one I remember was the Shoemaker Levy 9 hitting Jupiter in July 1994. So maybe Nibiru's last flyby was harmless last time. But we may not be likely so lucky next time. Before jumping to any conclusions we cannot sustain, let me bring you another popular Nibiru theory the planet Nibiru of Nemesis. Nemesis is supposedly our Sun's brown dwarf twin. 
The theory was first introduced in 1984, largely based on the Earth's mass extension 26 million year cycle. An evil twin 1.5 light years away, hidden beyond the Oort cloud, would be a perfect suspect. If Nibiru is a planet of Nemesis, it could explain how its occupants survived 3,600 years without a sun. Nemesis is Nibiru's travel companion and its portable generator. When the theory was introduced in 1984, it made great sense, and at that time, scientists believed that most stars are binary. Obviously, our sun should not be an exception. However, scientists have determined that mass extinction happens more like every 50 million years. And two mass astronomical surveys, which ran from 1997 to 2001, failed to detect any brown dwarf in our solar system. While in 2011, NASA's David Morrison, who specializes in near-Earth objects, concluded that even with infrared telescopes able to detect brown dwarfs as far away as 10 light years, failed to find Nemesis. It is most likely that Nemesis does not exist. Of course, that is if you believe in what NASA tells you. However, not finding any proof of Nibiru nor Nemesis does not mean they do not exist. Plus, how do you know if you were told the truth? What do you think the government should do if they think the world will end tomorrow? Obviously, telling you will not be on the top of the list. They will build a bunker and plan shelters for people that may survive the doomsday earth. And to avoid chaos, it is wise not to share the doomsday news with anyone. Plus, who can know for certain what will happen, right? If you think the government will always do the right thing, let me tell you what Nostradamus thought about that. will be struck from the sky. One who cannot proceed any further. The secret closed up with the revelation, such that they will march over and ahead. If you have any doubts about Nostradamus' prophecies, check out some of my Nostradamus videos. When I compared his quatrains with historical events, I was shocked to find the unbelievable details revealed. Check out any of my videos and you will be surprised. This quatrain is grouped with 20 other Doomsday quatrains in the second part of the Book of Prophecy, which I call the Doomsday Century. This quatrain seems to indicate that our government would get warnings from the sky, which can be divine, or from aliens. The message warns us, do not proceed. It is a secret that will be kept for most of us. But the warnings were probably ignored as the last sentence stated, quote, such that they will march over and ahead. Whatever the secret may be, it will be ignored, and we, mankind, will eventually face the consequences. So if Nemesis does not exist and Nibiru is only a theory, why should we waste any more time talking about it? Actually, I think Nibiru does exist. It may be different from the mythical planet where Anun Naki reside, but it is there. Let me show you. Across the world, for sports, for instance. Now, at that time, sports was something that children, uh, school children, were into. Adults became adults and got onto adult things. So it was unimaginable at the time that people could actually believe that uh, uh, there was even a need for adult sports and entertainment, never mind having ar arenas built across the world. But he said, we can do this. And you know, voiced basically a sports culture for the males. Using a tribal system, we're all tribal to an extent. That's why we even bother to vote for a tribal leader. Uh, this is well understood. That's why we're supplied with these leaders. And because the, the average man was to become more disengaged from his own destiny, as the expert class arose, it was decided that, that the males would get their, their, their outlet, basically, um, being gradually becoming helpless as, as males through sports. Therefore, they'd have a tribal team they could identify with. Uh, they would um, cheer them on as they were winning. In their own personal lives, they were getting nowhere. They were getting disenfranchised, in a sense, as experts took over 
um, decision making for them in all kinds of fields. So this was psychology at use, uh, planned before they even implemented the sports. Um, when radio came along, of course, they, they, they used that to the maximum. Uh, sports for the men, um, soaps basically for the women. And then in came television, as I say, with its alpha state, its hypnotic state. And sure enough, around the 1960s, really, 50s and 60s, it took off. It really, really took off. Uh, and men became glued on Saturday nights to the sports shows. A culture industry, which is called by its own the culture industry. The Soviet Union had a department called the culture industry. Their actors and directors were called the cultural leaders. Leaders. Because they would, like a computer, people are like computers, um, all you have to do is keep giving them new updates every so often and you can change an entire country or a nation or a block of nations who are all getting the same uploads, upgrades at the same time along certain paths. Today we call it political correctness. Most people want to belong to their peer group, they want to be the same as everyone else when it comes to opinions. In fact, they judge their own personal sanity by bouncing ideas off their, their neighbors and friends who will answer back and agree on these same topics in kind. It doesn't matter if the topics or, the, or what you're given are facts or, or utter nonsense, as long as everyone agrees at the same time, you'll say, well, I'm sane, and your friends will all agree because they've had the same information given to them. If it's on TV and a famous face uh, says something, then it must be true. He doesn't have to show you facts or anything else. You'd, you've been brought up with these faces. That's why they keep these guys on television into their 70s and 80s. You've grown up with this father figure who's on television every night at 6 o'clock uh, in your house, in your room, staring right at you. Uh, and he's a father figure. Would he tell you a lie? That, that, so you naturally never suspect him. And this same man will lead you through new topics. He'll, he'll introduce experts on the topics. They'll have a little summary at the end of every talk. And you are now left with the conclusion that's presented to you. As you, you don't arrive at it, it's given to you and it's good enough for you. We're programmed today uh, perfectly just like machines. We tie this, this in with the Brzezinski. Brzezinski said in two ages, now this guy was way up with the NSA. He was a, he's a master geopolitician. He works, in, he admits he works in, in 20, 50 year periods to do with geopolitics in other countries. But he said himself, the public will shortly be unable to think or reason for themselves. It was meaning by the, the form that, that of, of, of uh, information that was given to them, the type, the, the formulas that were in use then in the 1970s. He says, eventually they'll be unable to think or reason for themselves. They, and eventually, he said, they will expect the media uh, to do all their thinking and reasoning for them. Well, that's happened today. That, that's why people today can't think outside of the programming from television. This is a scientific dictatorship which Bertrand Russell said, and the Huxleys said, both Aldo and Julian Huxley said, they would bring in the scientifically controlled society are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy who have always existed and presumably always will exist uh, to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, this is the, seems to me the, the ultimate uh, in malevolent revolution shall we say. And uh, this is a this is a problem which uh, has interested me for many years and about which I wrote uh, 30 years ago a, a fable, The Brave New World, which is uh, essentially the account of a society making use of all the devices at that time available and some of the devices which uh, uh, I imagined to be possible 
uh, making use of them in order to, first of all, to standardize the population, to iron out uh, inconvenient human dis uh, um, differences, uh, to create, uh, so to say, mass-produced uh, models of human beings arranged uh, in some kind of a scientific uh, caste system.